No. Okay, so we continue with the five great preliminaries. Preliminaries, those five uh, preliminaries that we amass 100,000 of each. So last week uh, we did the first two, which is refuge and prostrations. And this, uh, this uh, class, we're going to do the offering of the mandala and making requests through Mixema prayer. The actual order uh, begins with refuge, prostration is number two, and number three is the hundred syllable mantra. But as we say, we will omit that and we will go into number four, the mandala offering, and number five, the mitzvah. Okay, so we're going to be dealing with the offering of mandala. So let's first look at the origin. The origin of the mandala offering is found in the sutra. It is known as the mandala sutra or the Sutra of the Great uh, Expanse. And in that, it has a verse that says, uh, offer uh, the whole continent, the world with the continents, uh, the, uh, the, mount the, the central mountain, and all the surrounding wealth in it. Also, we find it in uh, Guya Samaja um, Sutra and Tantra. There's reference in that. In terms of the mandalas, there are four types, the outer, the inner, the secret, and vastness mandala. Today, we will be dealing with the outer mandala. Okay, so we, in terms of the mandalas, we can have a different number of heaps, how many heaps are included in the mandala. We can have the safe heap, seven heap mandala, the nine heap mandala, the 23 heap mandala, and the 25 heap mandala. So definitely we begin with an enumeration of the Mount Meru and the four continents. And in addition to that, the, um, the two subcontinents in each one of these. Um, it becomes the... Um, uh, 20, it becomes the nine, in Kala Chakra, we have the nine hip mandala. In um, Buya Samaja, we have the 23 hips mandala. So we have Mount Meru, four continents, four subcontinents, uh, the seven uh, precious um, um, substances and so forth. And in addition to that, if you add the base and the mountains, you will get the 25. Okay, so the mandala that we usually offer is the 37 hip mandala. So the 37 hip mandala is, uh, is, has uh, the 23 hips. And in addition to that, we have the eight goddesses uh, plus all the uh, four um, things that we enjoy in the four continents and in addition to that we have the umbrella and the banner of victory so usually when you have a person who is doing the practice of accumulating many mandalas the first mandala will be the 20 the 37 hip mandala and then the remaining mandalas in the session will be the seven hip mandala Okay, so if you're going to offer a mandala, the first uh, thing that you will be concerned is the material uh, in which your mandala set is made of. If you can find it and if you can afford it, it can be made out of gold or it can be made out of silver or it could be made uh, out of any other metal alloy. Uh, it could be copper, for example. Or uh, it could be made out of wood, it could be made out of clay, or even it could be made out of stones. So we know that when Lama Tsongkhapa was doing his practice in Olga and was offering the mandalas, he used a stone, a flat stone as a mandala. The second thing to consider is the shape of your mandala base. And uh, you can have a round shape, it can be square shape, it could be triangular shape. So anything that you like, anything that suits you. Also the color of the mandala, it's not uh, set or specific because you could be offering a mandala and the color of the mandala could be matching the type of activities that you are seeking to achieve. And we have uh, activities of pacification, increase power and rough activities. 
the majority of people use a round mandala that is wide and it corresponds with activities of pacification. The next uh, thing to discuss is the size of the mandala base. And they say that the bigger the base of the mandala, the better it is. Uh, there is a, a mention of the smaller limit and they say it should not be smaller than the size of the bowl that you use for eating. All right, so there's limit only in terms of the smallest size. Okay, then the next thing is the material that you will be using to make up the heaps uh, in the mandala. All right, if you can have gold and silver and coral and, you know, other precious substances like this, uh, that would be very nice. But also if you don't have those, you could, for example, use medicine, different type of medicine, or you could use different types of grain, um, such as, for example, wheat and barley and rice and so forth. So any of this material would suffice. Okay, so when we use the mandala, the base of the mandala, you can see the bottom, which is the hollow, and the top. All right, so they say that it is very good to anoint the bottom part of the mandala and the sides inside with the five substances that are derived from a cow. So usually we receive a pill that contains those substances and you can soak the pill overnight and then with that liquid you can anoint the bottom of the base and the inside of the mandala. As for the top part of the mandala, usually we put some perfume or some nectar. So again, nectar, peel and so forth. Okay, so we have explained different things about the shape, the size, the material of the mandala, the substances that you can use to fill up the mandala and so on and so forth. Okay, so now let's look at uh, how you actually do this practice of accumulating mandala offerings. It is very good to do the practice of the accumulation of the mandala at the, say, at the center of your house or, you know, exactly where you live. You do it within your room. And as we explained yesterday with the other preliminaries, it is very good to first of all begin by cleaning the room. Then you will have to arrange your altar. You would have to put out some nice offerings and so forth. Once you've done this, then you sit down and you begin with the practice. The practice begins by going for refuge, generating bodhicitta and meditating on the four immeasurables. After that, you begin reciting the seven limb prayer. You can do the extensive version. You can do the short version. And when you come to the point of the seven limbs, when you come to the dedication, this is when you uh, offer the mandala. Okay, so um, when you pick up the mandala, it is said, the mandala base, right? It is said that it's inappropriate to pick it up with empty hands. And therefore, what we do, before you touch your mandala, you put a few grains on your left hand. So your left hand is not empty. And then with the, you pick up the mandala, and then with the left hand, you put some grain on the right hand. So now both of your hands have a little bit of grain. Okay, so now you have picked up the mandala and now you're going to sweep the mandala with your right arm. But the way that you do it is that you put your thumb at the base of your ring finger, all right? And so this is the position of the hands and then you start wiping the base of the mandala. You do three times wiping away away from you and when you do this you think that all the negativities of your body speech and mind are removed you're pushing those things away and then you wipe it in this uh, circling motion towards you and now you think that all the qualities of the body speech and mind all the blessings are coming your way Okay, so having done this, we are ready now to begin with uh, placing the grains. So let's, well, I'm going to use the example of the grains and the mandala. So we begin by saying, O Vajrabhumi Ahum, Om Vajrareke Ahum, Chi Chaki Koryu Korue Usu, Ri Gyalpo So when you say Ri Gyalpo which is the precious mountain, 
you put the first heap at the center of the mandala because this is what you're saying at the center there is the mound marrow and then it begins by saying um Okay, so now we're going in the four directions and putting the four continents. And it begins from the east. Okay, so where is the direction of the east? That depends on the type of the mandala that you offer. This is a requesting mandala, so the east is going to be the direction that is right in front of you towards you. If this is an offering mandala, the east is in front of you but away from you right so in front and away not in front kind of like touching you okay so you start from the east and then you go clockwise and you put um the four continents so so far you have put one for mount Meru and four for the four continents you have five Okay, so having placed the four continents, it is now time to put the two subcontinents. Each one of the continents has a subcontinent to its left and its right, okay? So we say that we have, um, okay, Lutan Lupak, these are for the east, and then we have, sorry, yeah, for the east, then in the south, we have uh, Ngayab and Ngayab Shen. Then in the west, we have Yonden, uh, Ta, uh, Yonden and Lamcho Dro. And then in the north, we have Draminyen and Draminyen Kida. Okay, so for each continent, you will put two, starting from the left, one, two. Then you move to the next one, left right left right left right so in this way you place two subcontinents next to each continent okay so now that we have placed the continents and the subcontinents we are ready to place uh, four objects that are called precious things these are things that are enjoyed special enjoyments or special wealth that exists in each one of the four continents the first one is the precious mountain in the east then we have the wish granting tree in the south then we have the wish fulfilling cow in the west and the uncultivated harvest in the north so once you have placed a heap a handful a heap representing each one of those you're ready to put the second round of the mandala on top okay so the next uh, round of uh, heaps that we will be offering is uh, comprises of eight precious uh, objects from those eight precious objects we have the seven precious ones plus the vase okay so these are going to be placed in the four cardinal and the four intermediate directions so we begin by putting the precious wheel to the east, the precious jewel to the south, the precious queen to the west, the precious minister to the north. So with this, we have done the four cardinal directions. Now we begin with the intermediate directions. To the southeast, we will have precious elephant. To the southwest, precious horse. To the northwest, the precious ger general. And now we're left with the last, last one, which is the treasure vase, and that goes to the northeast. Okay, so now we're ready to place the third ring in the mandala and begin by offering the eight goddesses. Again, they're going to be placed first in the four cardinal directions and then another four in the intermediate directions. So for the first one, the goddess of beauty, she goes to the east, the goddess of garland to the south, goddess of song to the west, goddess of dance to the north. And then we have goddess of flowers, southeast, goddess of incense, southwest, goddess of light, northwest, goddess of perfume, northeast. Okay, then uh, we have to put the sun and the moon. The sun goes to the south, the moon goes to the north. Then we have the parasol and the parasol 
comes away from you, like in front of you, but away from you. And then we have the banner of victory. This is the one that you want to put right in front of you. Okay, and now we come to the very end, the very last sentence of the mandala, where it says, and the center all possessions precious to gods and humans lacking in nothing. So with that, you take the last handful of materials and you just put it at the very top, at the center top of the mandala. So you've offered everything. And then you hold the mandala with both of your hands now. It should be at the level of your heart, right in front of you. And this is how you offer it. So they say that when we do this mandala offering, you do not shrink down, you know, the whole universe to fit in your mandala base. And also it is not the case that you expand the mandala base. Somehow you have to visualize that you have everything there present in their right dimensions and uh, right size. And if you can actually visualize that you're offering many multiples of those, right? So you have the Mount Meru, the four continents, the subcontinents, all the wealth and the enjoyments. If you could visualize many more of that, there would be bigger merit. If you cannot master this visualization, you just say, think you have the whole universe here, everything is complete and you offer it. So they say the merit like this is quite significant. So we say that when we set up the mandala and we uh, and we offer it it is very good to see the mandala as a pure field but also that we offer it to all the pure fields and if you do it like this there you create a very auspicious interdependence the person who is offering the mandala is very good if they can actually emanate countless bodies or as many bodies as the pure field that exists and therefore thinking that each one of my emanated bodies is going to one pure field and making a mandala offering to them. So if you can multiply um, the visualization in this way, it's very beneficial. So when we make the offering to the mandala, we offer the mandala to the ultimate field or the best recipients for offerings, which is the Lama and the Buddhas. And we do it with an incredible sense of faith and respect. And we offer the mandala because we aspire to reach a state of Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. And when the recipients of the mandala, so all the Buddhas or the dead, is and the guru perceive that within our own mind we have such an intention uh, they become delighted with our conduct and they want to help us accumulate this merit that we are seeking for so because they are pleased they release um, a rain of nectar and light that comes and enters within the body of myself and all other sentient beings it removes and clears away our negativities our obscurations, illness, um, problems with uh, spirits and so forth. It increases our life, our merit, our realizations, our qualities, and in this way we receive all the blessings. Okay, so when uh, you, the first mandala that you offer is the extensive mandala of the 37 hips, and when you finish with offering and the visualization, you tip and empty the mandala so that all the material comes towards you. Because remember, this is a requesting mandala. You're requesting for blessings. So you want everything to come your way. Okay, so the first mandala is going to be the extensive mandala. And then after that, you're going to use the short mandala in order to do the quick accumulation of the numbers. So we, uh, you do this, the usual things where you pick up the mandala and we say you have to wipe three times away from you and three times towards you. And once you're doing this, you recite the refuge and bodhicitta verse. I go for refuge and I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly by the merit of uh, gathering, of practicing generosity and the other perfections, may I reach the state of enlightenment to benefit all mother sentient beings. Right? So this is once you're wiping the mandala, and then you start with the short mandala, right? Saji Purki. 
this ground anointed book with perfume strewn with flowers adorned with marmero, um, the four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this as a Buddha field and I offer it. Idam Guru, um, Idam Guru, Idam Mandala Niryataya me. So that's it. You have offered a mandala and then you go for the next mandala. Again, refuge and bodhicitta and then the short mandala. So, okay, so like this, you do a session. In a session, you should be able to accumulate something between 250 to 300 mandalas. And at the end of your session, you finish the last mandala. Again, it has to be an extensive mandala, 37 hip mandala. So the very first that you do and the very last that you do has to be a long mandala. And then you conclude the session and you do your dedication. Right. So the important thing here, again, as we stressed with the other preliminaries, is not to be obsessed with the numbers. But the important thing is to do the visualizations and the thinking correctly. So the things that you have to keep in mind is that doing this practice for the sake of all sentient beings, your ultimate aim is to reach the state of enlightenment. You're offering the mandala to the guru and to the Buddhas. Uh, you're offering the mandala with a very strong sense of faith and respect and you offer the mandala with a you know, uh, joyful attitude to them. As for the objects of refuge, the objects of refuge, they understand what we are seeking to do and in order to help us to accumulate the merit that we want, they accept the mandala, they are pleased and they accept the mandala and therefore they release a, a rain of nectar. This nectar removes and purifies negativities, obscurations, illness and so forth and allows us to increase our merit, our lifespan, our realizations um, and so forth. Now, there is a particular way that we describe the practice of the mandala and we say for the, it is very good if your mandala offering is complete in the six perfections. So the way that we describe this is as follows. So the fact that you're going to be offering the five substances that are derived from the cow corresponds to the practice of generosity, number one. Number two, the fact that you are uh, you anoint the, the interior or, or the underside of the mandala with these uh, um, five substances of the uh, from the cow, and then you anoint the top of the mandala and the material that you use with uh, perfume, is the practice of ethics. The third one, the fact that you make sure that in the grains you remove any insects. So you want to have clean grains because otherwise you might harm uh, insects and that corresponds to the practice of patience. The fourth one, the fact that you do the mandala every day corresponds to enthusiastic effort and it brings you closer to your aim. The fifth one, um, the fact that you are single-pointedly concentrating on the focal object whilst you do the mandala is the practice of concentration. And the sixth one, the fact that you arrange the heaps properly corresponds to the practice of wisdom. So um, as we say, we offer the, we make the mandala offering and if you are meditating on the lab rim, you will find that it makes it much easier to generate the realizations because it allows you to accumulate that much merit. There is a story with uh, Ekadamba Geshe, Geshe Kamboa, and uh, he would uh, meditate. He was doing meditation, but he was neglecting to do his mandala. Right, and one day, uh, Drum Tompa, I guess, Drum Tompa went and visited, and he said, um, "What are you meditating on? And you know, what are you doing with your practice of the mandala?" And he had to confess, you know, that his his meditation. He was getting a little bit distracted in his meditation, and but also he, due to the meditation, he didn't have time to make mandala offerings, right? He thought it was not important practice. And Drum Tumpa really scolded him and he says, what are you saying? 
like Master Atisha was such a much greater practitioner than all of us, and he would not let one single day go without offering the mandala three times a day. So who are you to say that a mandala is a, kind of like an inferior practice? And he, from that day onwards, Geshe Gampoa took on again the practice of making the mandala. And he found that it was much easier to generate realizations on the subject he was meditating on without much effort. Okay, so this should be enough for the mandala offering. If you have any doubt as for the arrangement of the hips in the mandala, well, you can Google it these days. We are very fortunate. You can do a search in the internet and definitely you will find different, you know, drawings and diagrams of how to place the hips in the mandala. Anyway, if you don't find something or if you still have any doubts about it, you're welcome to come back and ask clarification questions about the arrangement of the hips. So remember, when we offer the mandala, it is very important to get the visualizations right. Um, always begin the practice by going for refuge, bodhicitta, meditating on the four immeasurables. And then after that, you start with the seven limb prayer. And in within the seven limb prayer, you will make the mandala offering. And at the end, you will have to conclude with your dedication prayers. And uh, when you build up the numbers, the, you need to have like a quick way of doing the mandala. And you do this with the combination of the verse for refuge and bodhicitta followed by the short um, mandala, the Saji Purki. So we'll move now into the next subject, which is making requests. Now, in the Geluk tradition, when we make requests, we make requests really through the Mitzema prayer, but you could make the request by relying on the name mantra of your guru as well. However, most, uh, most often oh, we do it through the Mitzema. So the request here is a request um, to appeal to the to the mind of uh, your guru. Okay, so when we do this practice to accumulate a hundred thousand of those requests, it is very good if you do the mitzema in uh, conjunction with the hundred deities of Tushita. Okay, so when you actually do the practice, just as we've seen with all the other practices, you need to do the basic preliminaries. So the basic preliminaries, they are the same for everything, whether you do uh, prostrations, whether you go for refuge, whether you do the mandala offering, whether you do the mixema, it's the same. First, you have to begin by cleaning the room. The next thing that you do is you arrange your altar. And the thing after that is that you present nine offerings and then you are ready to start the practice so here with the practice this practice Geshe was saying I think we can very clearly identify that we have preliminaries actual parts and conclusion okay so um, having organized the room and the offerings and so forth the preliminaries of this practice is uh, sitting in a comfortable seat in the posture of Virochana. So the fourth of the usual list of preliminaries is the first of the preliminaries of this practice. And then the next one is um, going for refuge from within a virtuous mind. So that means that first of all, you adjust your motivation. And then after that, you meditate on refuge, bodhicitta and the four immeasurables. So Geshe says the preliminaries for this practice Practice is sitting in your seat and um, meditating on refuge, bodhicitta, and the four immeasurables. Okay, then uh, having done the preliminaries, we come to the actual part or the main part of the practice. So in terms of the main part of the practice, uh, we identify two sections. In the first part, what we will do is we'll be inviting Lama Tsongkhapa and his two spiritual sons from um, Tushita. 
And once they come, we want to offer them the seven limb prayer. And having done that, we make requests to them through the Mixema. So invite, make the seven limb prayers is the first part. And then make the request through Mixema is the second part. Mm. Okay, so as we say, the first part is to invite Lama Tsongkhapa and his two main disciples um, and offer the seven limb prayer. So another way that we describe this is establishing the field of merit and offering the seven limb prayers in order to accumulate that merit. So we will invite Lama Tsongkhapa and his two spiritual sons and they will come from Ganden or Tushita. So this Tushita is not the Tushita that we mentioned the other day. Remember we were talking about abodes of gods within uh, samsara, right? Desire realm and so forth. So this is not that desire realm um, pure land um, or to, uh, desire realm, uh, god realm. However, it is the pure land of protector materia. So when we invite them, they will come from the heart of the protector materia. So the first verse that we of, of the uh, of the Ganden Lagema um, is the um, the verse of inviting them. So from the heart of the protector of the land of joy comes a, a cloud resembling white curd at its crest is omniscient Los Antrapa and his spiritual sons. Please come to this abode. So this is the invocation. So as we say, when we invite Lama Tsongkhapa and his uh, spiritual sons to come, they come from the heart of uh, Protector Matriya. So Protector Matriya is abiding in his pure land of Tushita. So the pure land of Tushita is much more elevated than the Tushita that is the abode within the desire realm. So we have the desire realm Tushita, uh, that it also has a palace, and then we have much higher than that the Tushita, that is the pure land of Protector Matria. It is an amazing place. The ground is made out of precious substances, and it has this quality that it is soft and yielding to the touch. So if you press it, it will go down. If you release it, it will kind of like rise up. And it, as you touch it, it generates bliss. So it is all made out of precious substances and it has wish-fulfilling trees. Those wish-fulfilling trees, every part of the tree is made out of precious substances. And they are all the animals there, such as the birds, for example, they tweet and they teach the Dharma. And in... Um, in the center of that amazing array, there is the palace of Protector Matria, and there is a very big um, banner of victory at the very tip of that palace. The palace is surrounded by garlands and uh, half garlands of precious stones and at the very center is Protector Matria. So Lama Tsongkhapa will come out of the heart of Protector Matria. So at the center of the palace, there is a special courtyard where uh, Buddha Matriya is actually teaching the Dharma. And in the very center of that courtyard, there is a very large throne made out of precious substances and supported by snow lions. At the center of the throne, there is the th seat made of a variegated lotus, and upon that sits, sits Protector Matria. The color of his body is the color of refined gold and ha is actually radiating incredible light. The same way that if the rays of the sun were to strike a golden mountain, sim you know, that amount of light that it would radiate, similarly, the whole body of Protector Matria is radiating this golden light. He is, uh, he is marked by all the major and minor marks and signs. 
and he's he has one face and two arms and his sitting posture is the sitting posture that we assume when we are sitting in a chair his two hands are in the mudra of teaching the dharma of turning the wheel of dharma um, and he is facing his uh, the southern continent which is our he's facing our direction so rays of light emanate from him uh, as he's looking in our direction. He's surrounded by Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, of course, Lama Tsongkhapa, his two disciples, and many deities. There are many deities there who uh, make continuous offerings. So there are clouds of offerings that surround him. So in the middle of that scene, always... Um, in a very uh, happy state of mind, he's continuously teaching the Prajnaparamita texts. From his heart comes a cloud. The cloud is totally white and it extends outside so that it can accommodate the seeds or the places where Lama Tsongkhapa and his two disciples will be. The shape of the cloud is the shape of the endless knot and it extends out of his heart. So as I say, we visualize this white cloud coming out of the heart of Protector Madhya and it comes towards us. So the end of the cloud is almost like, it has like three round um, places. In the center of that, we will have, in the central place, we will have Lama Tsongkhapa. To his right, we will have Gelsabje. To his left, we will have Kedru Rinpoche. So Lama Tsongkhapa has uh, the youthful aspect. He's wearing the Pandita yellow hat. He's wearing the three types of robes. He's sitting in the full uh, Vajra posture and his hands is in the mudra of turning the wheel of Dharma. And as we say, to his right is Gelsabje, to his left is Kedru Rinpoche. Now, um, Gelsabje and Kedru Rinpoche, they have uh, texts in their hands. And whatever text you happen to be studying, now visualize that the text that they are holding is the same text that you are studying. And they say that in this way, you will... Um, uh, you will very quickly develop the realizations and the understanding of whatever subject it is that you are studying. That you are studying. Okay, so uh, you have all seen the statue of Lama Tsongkhapa, so you know uh, how exactly how that statue looks. You know, with the f with the flowers opening uh, at the level of his ears and so forth. So once we have invited them, we proceed by making the seven limb uh, prayer, the seven limb offering. Now, the usual way that we do the seven limb prayer or offering is that we begin with the first one is prostration, the second one is making offerings, the third one is confession, the fourth one rejoicing, the fifth one requesting them to turn the wheel of Dharma, and this, the sixth one is requesting not to pass into Paranirvana. Here in this practice, when we do the seven limb prayer, the first limb that we do is to request them not to pass into Paranirvana. The reason for that is because we want to make all these offerings, all these requests and so forth to this particular field of merit. So the first thing we want to ensure is that the field of merit remains. So the first thing that we ask them is we ask them to remain, not pass into Paranirvana. So in, uh, when you do Gantem Lagema, the 100 deities, from the seven limbs, the first is to request not to pass into Paranirvana. Okay, so um, the second verse of the um, the second verse is the request not to pass into Paranirvana. So it says, Venerable Gurus, with your white smiles of delight, seated on lion thrones, lotus and moon in the space before me, please remain for hundreds of eons in order to spread the teachings as the supreme field of merit for my mind of faith. So you visualize the three figures um, seated on lion thrones upon lotus and moon. They're in the space in front of you. 
and you they are delighted as they're looking at you and you request them to remain for hundreds of eons so that you can uh, do the practices to accumulate merit with a mind that is completely filled with faith so that was the first of the seven limbs the second limb is the limb of prostration so this comes here with the next verse that says your intelligent mind comprehends all objects uh, the full extent of objects of knowledge. Your elegant speech is the ear ornament of the fortunate. Your beautiful bodies blaze with glory renowned. I prostrate to you who are meaningful to see, hear, and recall. So here you visualize that you emanate hundreds uh, of thousands of hundreds of bodies, and with your body, speech, and mind, you prostrate as you recite this verse. Okay, we'll continue with the next limb, which is the limb of offering. I offer this ocean-like cloud of offerings actually arranged and mentally created to you, the supreme field of merit, such as pleasing water offerings, various flowers, fragrant incense, light, scented water, and so on. So as you say, you must have already arranged whatever offerings you have at the beginning of the practice. Hopefully they are extensive. And in any case, you visualize very extensive offerings that you are presenting to them. So after having made the offerings, the next step is the limb of confession. Whatever non-virtuous actions of body, speech, and mind I have accumulated since beginningless time, and in particular this mass of transgressions of my three vows, I confess individually with sin sincere regret. So here you remember any transgressions of the three types of vows that you have taken. So vows of individual liberation, bodhisattva vows, tantric vows, all of this uh, transgression with very strong sense of regret, similar to having um, ingested poison, you wish to confess all of those things and you must have a very strong mind of restraint that you will not do it again in the future. Okay, so we continue with the next branch, which is the branch or the limb of rejoicing. In this life of degeneration, you studied extensively and strove to practice. And by abandoning the eight concerns, your life of freedom and endowments became meaningful. From the depths of my heart, I rejoice, O protector, in the great waves of your deeds. So here we bring into mind all the great activities of Lama Tsongkhapa, and we sincerely rejoice for everything he has done. In his own words, he when he described... Uh, how he progressed along the path. He says, in the beginning, I sought extensive instruction. In the middle, all scriptural systems appeared as my personal advice. And in the end, I practice day and night. I dedicate everything to the spread of the teachings. So these are the very words of Lama Tsongkhapa that indicate how sincerely and intensively he sought to understand the meaning. And as it says here, he did this by completely abandoning the eight worldly concerns. So bringing all this to mind, rejoice in his activities. So the next one, the sixth one, is urging to turn the wheel of Dharma. May the rain of profound and extensive Dharma fall from the billowing clouds of wisdom and compassion gathered in the sky of your Dharma body, venerable holy guru, to care for disciples in any way appropriate. Um, okay, so after that, we come into the last of seven limbs, which is the dedication. It says, may any virtue that I have accumulated benefit the entire teachings and all reincarnating beings. In particular, may the essence of the teachings of Venerable Loss and Trakpa shed illumination for a very long time. So whatever virtue I have created over the three times, in the past, in the present, whatever I will do in the future, I dedicate all of this so that the teachings that are so such great benefit for sentient beings will remain, and in particular the teachings, the realizations, um, 
that come the teachings of Lama Tsongkhapa, the realizations of Lama Tsongkhapa, remain for a very long time. So up to here, you can see that we had eight verses. The first one was the invitation or the invocation. And then we had seven verses, each one dedicated to one of the seven limb prayers. So this concludes the first part, inviting and offering the seven limb prayers. And then after that, we begin with the request, the actual part of the request. Okay, so uh, when we come to the actual part where we do the, requ the request through the Mitzema praise, what happens is that, first of all, impurity is washed away, and secondly, ignorance is removed. And we do this by establishing different types of wisdom. So the body establishes vast wisdom, the speech establishes clear wisdom, the seed syllable establishes the swift wisdom, the hand symbol establishes the profound wisdom, and then we have explanation um, established through the text, debate established through the sword, and composition established through the text and the sword. So this is how we do the removing, washing away the impurity and removing ignorance. Okay, so um, we say that the next step after we have made this, invited and made the seven lane prayer, the next part, the actual part, involves removing the impurity. And uh, we do this once we recite the Mixema. And also we will visualize that we receive different types of wisdom. So when uh, we do the recitation of Mitzema, and in particular when you accumulate the numbers for Mitzema, there are different versions of this verse. You, the verse might have four lines or five lines or six lines or eight lines or nine lines. So we have variations. Most of the people accumulate the numbers through the four-line Mitzema, but there are also people who do it through the five-line Mitzema. So if it is only four lines, it is Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of non-reifying uh, non uh, compassion. Manjushri, master of stainless wisdom. Tsongkhapa, crown jewel of the scholars of the land of joy, of snows. Losan Drakpa, I make request at your feet. So these are the four-line Mektsema. It becomes five lines if you add... After you say Manjushri, Master of Stainless Wisdom, you add, add the, the line that says, Secret Lord, Destroyer of Hordes of Mara. And then you continue, Tsongkhapa, Crown Jewel of the Scholars of the Land of Snows, Los Antrapa, I make request at your feet. Okay, so now when we make the request uh, through the Mitzema, this request is done in uh, three ways. First of all, we do the request uh, by understanding the internal, the external, and the secret nature. Uh, secondly, we do the request by understanding that they possess this and this quality. And thirdly, we do it by understanding that they have a nature inseparable from the deity. Okay, so when uh, we begin making the request uh, through the Mitzema, if you look at the actual verse of Mitzema, it begins by saying, Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of non refined compassion, Manjushri, master of stainless wisdom. So actually what it does is recognizing that Lama Tsongkhapa has exactly these very same qualities. So the first line is talking about the quality of great compassion that we find in Avalokiteshvara, in Chenrezig. So there is no other bodhisattva that has the amount or the intensity of compassion that Avalokiteshvara or Chenrezig has. All right, so basically it's saying that Lama Tsongkhapa, you have compassion that is similar to that of Avalokiteshvara. The second line is describing the wisdom of Manjushri. So it says, Manjushri, master of stainless wisdom. There is no other bodhisattva, there's no other being that has that stainless or sharp wisdom that um, Manjushri has. So we're saying that Lama Tsongkhapa actually has this quality of wisdom similar to what Manjushri has. And this is why the first line talks about Avalokiteshvara, the second one about Manjushri, and then it says, 
uh, Tsongkhapa, crown jewel of the scholars of the land of snows, Lawson Trakpa, I make a request to you. I make a request to you recognizing that your qualities match the qualities of these two deities. So the, when we do the request, initially basically we're saying, I make a request to Lama Tsongkhapa, who has qualities similar to those of Avalokiteshvara and those of Manjushri. Amongst all the Bodhisattvas, it is Avalokiteshvara who has the highest affection or compassion. No other Bodhisattva matches the amount of compassion that Avalokiteshvara has. And similarly, there's no other Bodhisattva that can match um, Manjushri in terms of wisdom. So we say here, Lama Tsongkhapa, you who is the crown jewel of the scholars uh, of the land of joy, you have qualities equal to these two. Then we're looking at the, uh, making the request, my understanding that Lama Tsongkhapa has a similar type of inner qualities, meaning the inner realizations. So again, his realization in terms of compassion is similar to that of Avalokiteshvara. His realization of wisdom is similar to that of Manjushri. So it's a request understanding the level of his inner qualities. So when uh, we make the request recognizing the internal qualities, which is the level of realization, like the scholarship of uh, Lama Tsongkhapa, we make the request and basically we say, you know, I'm requesting that I be able to develop the same amount of understanding and scholarship that you have. Please bless me that I have this similar quality. Then when we make the request, and this time we're looking at the secret qualities. When we look at the secret qualities, we look at the level of practice, what Lama Tsongkhapa attained through his practice. And when we make the request through the Mitsema, basically we're saying, please bless me to be able to accomplish or to establish everything that you uh, accomplished through your practice. So this is how the request is done by understanding uh, the external, the internal and the secret qualities. So we also make a request to Lama Tsongkhapa through Mitsema uh, to the one who is indivisible in nature from the secret special deity. So that means that we recognize that Lama Tsongkhapa in reality is a deity. And um, the, we, we begin by thinking that um, if the compassion of all the Buddhas of the three times were to be consolidated and it would take an aspect, it would take the aspect of one special deity and that special deity will be Avalokiteshvara. This is what Chenrezig or Avalokiteshvara symbolizes. And when that deity manifests in a human aspect, it appears as Lama Tsongkhapa. Then if we take all the wisdom of the Buddhas of the three times and we consolidate this, if that were to appear in the aspect in a form of the deity, it would appear in the aspect of Manjushri. And when Manjushri manifests as a human, it is Lama Tsongkhapa. And finally, we have all the power of the Buddhas of the three times. When that appears in the form of the deity, it appears in the form of the deity of the secret Lord Vajrapani. And when Vajrapani appears as a human, it appears as Lama Tsongkhapa. So now we're making requests to Lama Tsongkhapa, understanding that his nature is no different from those special deities. So when we make the request where we recognize Lama Tsongkhapa as being indivisible in nature from the three uh, deities, we make the request and we say, please bless me to quickly generate within my mind stream the special compassion, the special wisdom and the special power of those three deities. So as you can see here, we're making uh, three rounds of requests. The first one is making requests to the one who manifests an equal external form. Then we're making requests to the one who possesses those internal qualities. And finally, we're making requests 
to uh, the one who is indivisible in nature from the secret special deity. And following that, we have the actual part where impurities are removed. So as a result of having made the request, three pipes um, come out of the hearts of each one of the three main figures. So they're like white pipes. When they come to, initially when they come out, there are three distinct pipes, but when they come to our place, uh, they all merge into one. So now we have one single pipe that comes into the crown of our head. And through this, pound, this pipe descend um, white light and white nectar. It completely fills our body and drives away all ignorance and the darkness of ignorance. So it is as a great difference, like when you are in a dark room and you turn on the light and that light instantly eliminates the darkness. So when we receive this um, nectar and light, all the ignorance remo is removed, leaves our mind stream. So first of all, through the request, we uh, remove the impurities and then we receive uh, special types of wisdom to remove our ignorance. The first one that we receive, as the text says, the body establishes a vast wisdom. So during this phase, we see that from the pipes that descend from Jeremiah and his two spiritual sons, now flows nectar and light that is orange in color it's not white now it's orange and it comes and enters within our body now this nectar is made out of atoms and every atom in that nectar is a small body of orange manjushri so as the nectar the orange nectar fills our body our body is filled with those tiny like atom size orange manjushris Rays of light emanate from all these bodies of Manjushri that are within us and they invite the wisdom and the realizations of all the Buddhas in the ten directions. This wisdom of the Buddhas comes in the aspect of bodies of Manjushri that are different sizes. Some are going to be small, some are going to be very large. All these Manjushri bodies, uh, they come and absorb through the pores of our skin. And they come within the Manjushris, that the atom-sized Manjushris that we have within our own bodies. They dissolve there. And as they dissolve, we think that we have established this incredibly vast wisdom a wisdom that equals the wisdom of Manjushri, where we have complete understanding of all the texts that exist, the meaning of those texts. We can very clearly comprehend all of that. Okay, so as you can see here, we actually have uh, seven types of wisdom, but we ran out of time and we have just explained the first one, how the body establishes the vast wisdom. However, if you understand the first one, you will. Uh, it's not difficult to understand the remaining. The remaining ones follow the same pattern. All right. So the first one it says the body establishes vast wisdom. So the body talks about you know you you have little bodies of manjushri entering within your body, and this is how you obtain this vast wisdom. The second one is the speech which really is the mantra and establishes clear wisdom. Then you have the seed syllable that establishes the swift wisdom. And then you have the hand symbol establishing profound wisdom. And then you have, you want to have the wisdom for explanation, for debate, for composition. And you're going to do this through the text, the swords and text and swords combined. Okay, so the important thing is to make request. Uh, okay, so first of all, we establish, um, you know, you, you start from the beginning, right? Uh, you go for refuge, you generate bodhicitta, you do the four immeasurables. Then you invite uh, Lama Tsongkhapa and his two spiritual sons. They come invited from the heart of the protector, Matriya, 
who is at the land of Tushita. And once you invite them, you make the seven limb offerings. Okay, once you've done the seven limb offerings, you begin with making the requests. And the whole point with the request is to um, remove the impurity and to remove ignorance. Okay, so you do request in three ways. You do request but to the one who manifests the equal external form. You do the request to the one who possesses those internal qualities. And you do the request to the one who is indivisible in nature from the secret special deity. And having done this request, you see that there are three pipes that come out of the heart of each one of those uh, figures. They combine into one, they come into your, in the crown of your head, and they release this descent of nectar and light. So when you're removing the impurity, which is the first phase, everything is white. Nectar and light are white. They come and they completely fill your body. And by filling your body, you feel that all impurities, like the mass of your impurities, is totally shattered and is expelled completely from your body. So the same way, think the analogy of turning on the light that completely eliminates the darkness in a room. Having removed the impurity... The next thing is to remove the ignorance. And for the first one, in order to establish vast wisdom, you make the request and you visualize that orange uh, nectar and light descend and enter in your body. This nectar that has entered into your body has atoms, and those atoms are tiny little Manjushri, orange Manjushri bodies. They send out rays of light, and they invite the knowledge of all the Buddhas. The knowledge of all the Buddhas comes back to you in the aspect of bodies of Manjushri. But now when they come back to you, they have different sizes from the tiny one to the biggest one. They come and you absorb them through the pores of the body. They enter within your body. So now your body is completely filled with orange light and with all these bodies of Manjushri. So in this way, you think that you have obtained the vast wisdom of Manjushri. So your wisdom is similar to Manjushri. Any object of knowledge, any subject in any text, you are able to fully comprehend on your own. You have the capacity. No one needs to explain it to you. You understand it on your own. So this is the first one, uh, establishing the vast wisdom through the body. Okay, so at the, we have to look now at the conclusion. The conclusion is when you recite the verse that says, My glorious and precious root guru, take your seat on the lotus and moon, and moon at my heart. Please take care of me with your great kindness and bestow on me the cities of your body, speech, and mind. So now you visualize that Lama Tsongkhapa actually, like the two figures actually dissolve into Lama Tsongkhapa and Lama Tsongkhapa comes at the crown of your head and then gradually it comes down and dissolves at your heart at your heart you have this combination of wind and mind so you have this uh, um, innate wind and mind extremely subtle and you think that Lama Tsongkhapa has dissolved there and has become indivisible in nature from your own wind and mind. So you think, I am totally blessed. So with this, you come to the end and you do your dedication and your prayers. All right, so uh, we uh, need to stop here for tonight. We've gone a little bit over time. But as you can see, we managed to today to present uh, two preliminaries. And... Um, the thing is that in this way, we presented uh, four out of the five preliminaries of which you have to accumulate 100,000 of each. We have excluded the presentation of the 100-syllable mantra because you must have an initiation in order to receive explanation of that. But other than that, we have explained the other four. So uh, Geshe was saying that if you begin uh, building up 
the numbers of you know those preliminaries as you do the practice you will come up with many questions right so when you start the practice and when you have the questions coming up please do not hesitate to ask for further clarifying questions further today especially as we were doing the in in the Ganten Klagema, in the Mitzema, uh, we said that there are different types of wisdom, but we only presented the first one. So if you wish to know more about the other ones, you're most welcome to ask questions, and this is the way to uh, cover the remaining material. So, uh, but the thing is that we have to go back into our Lamrim class. So the next class, next week, we'll be back into the Lamrim. We have finished the first two parts, the path shared with the individual of the small scope and the middle scope. And we need to start now with the great scope. Okay, so thank you. We stop here for tonight and uh, apologies for have gone over time. <laughs>